Hello, Fellowship Bible Church family and anybody else that might be watching. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Slade Reinhardt. I'm the Director of Youth Ministry and Adult Connect and Grow Ministries here at Fellowship. It's my privilege today to bring God's Word to you, and I'll be continuing our sermon series going through the book of Romans called Live by Faith. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. Believe it or not, I'm going to cover the entire chapter today, but because there is so much material in this chapter, I'll just be hitting some of the high points instead of exploring all the details. To help you understand what Paul is doing in Romans chapter 4, think about this. In the world of science, when there is a principle that is proposed, one of the ways that the principle is proven true is by turning to an example of that principle in operation. For instance, we all know that the Earth not only revolves around the sun, but it also rotates on its own axis. But how would you prove that to be true, that the Earth rotates on its own axis? Well, in 1851, there was a French scientist by the name of Leon Foucault who came up with an idea to do just that. He created what's known as the Foucault Pendulum. He took a bob, which is the weight on a pendulum, that was about 60 pounds, and he suspended it on a wire that was over 200 feet long. Once the pendulum began swinging, the plane of its swing would rotate throughout the day, thus proving the principle of the Earth's rotation upon its own axis. So he took this principle and he gave an example of that principle in operation in order to prove it. That's exactly what Paul's doing in Romans chapter 4. Think back for just a minute where we are in the book. <clears throat> for the first several chapters, the Apostle Paul established as clearly and repeatedly and firmly as you can do that all people are sinful, that everyone falls short of God's perfect requirements. He quoted, for instance, from the Psalms that say, no one seeks God, no one does, God, uh, no one does what is right. Uh, there is none righteous before God. And then at one point near the end of chapter 3, he said this, we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Then in chapter 4, Paul proves that principle by showing it in operation in the life of Father Abraham. Now, why did Paul choose Abraham as his example? Well, Paul is mainly talking to the Jewish Christians in the Church of Rome at this point. The Jewish believers are the ones who are more likely to have a hard time grasping the idea of justification by faith because of their relationship with the law of God and because of the misunderstandings that have built up through the centuries around the law of God, their relationship to it and its relationship to God himself. Abraham was also the father of the Jewish people. He was the first Hebrew and he was the father of the Jewish faith. He was regarded as a paragon of godliness and virtue. In fact, in a Jewish book that was highly regarded, not part of the Bible, but a highly regarded Jewish book, called the Book of Jubilees, it says this about Abraham. Abraham was perfect in all his deeds with the Lord and well-pleasing in righteousness all the days of his life. Nobody had more credibility in the mind of Jewish people than Abraham, so that's who Paul turns to to prove the doctrine of justification by faith. Now, the first half of this chapter is structured around five questions that Paul asks. And these can really be summarized in two questions. The first one is this, how was Abraham justified? Look at verses one through eight with me. What then shall we say, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the man to whom God counts righteousness 
apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Verse 1 is clearly addressed to the Jewish members of the congregation in Rome. You'll recall from some of our lead pastor Todd Malone's previous sermons that the church in Rome was composed of both Jews and Gentiles. Now here Paul is specifically addressing the Jewish members because he refers to Abraham as our forefather according to the flesh. In other words, I'm talking to people who are physically descended from Abraham. As I mentioned before, they were the ones that would have a harder time grasping the idea of justification by faith because by this time, the relationship of Jews to the law tended to be that they were justified by keeping the law. So Paul picked Abraham, who was, as I mentioned before, highly regarded by Jews, the founder of their faith, the father of their people. The Net Bible actually translates the uh, verse 1 this way. What then shall we say that Abraham has discovered regarding this matter? Did Abraham discover he was justified by works before God? Or did he discover that he was justified by faith before God? And then in verse 2 he gives an answer. Abraham was not justified by works. Now the phrasing here is difficult to follow, but I found that John Calvin's commentary on this verse helps to make it clear. He says that verse 2 is really an incomplete argument, that Paul left the reader to fill in the gaps that he left. If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. Now at that point, we would expect that Paul would say, but Abraham was not, uh, does not have something to boast about, therefore he was not justified by works. Instead, he jumps to the phrase, but not before God. He doesn't have something to boast about before God. Calvin paraphrased the verse this way. If Abraham was justified by works, he might justly glory. But he had nothing for which he could glory before God. Then he was not justified by works. Remember that Paul had already established that no one could be justified by works before God. He said, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So again, he drives home that conclusion with respect to Abraham, saying, Abraham couldn't boast before God because he wasn't justified by works. Calvin added, since Paul takes this away from Abraham, who of us can claim the least particle of merit? Then Paul turns to Old Testament scripture and says, what does the scripture say? And he quotes Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now that verse, Genesis 15, 6, that is the key verse in this whole chapter. Everything that Paul says is related to that verse. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. It was not Abraham's works that gained righteousness for him. Righteousness was counted to him for believing this word counted means to put into one's account. Some versions say credited or re reckoned. <clears throat> this is what, uh, where we get the theological term imputed. It was imputed or credited to Abraham's account. Abraham's account was credited with righteousness. And that righteousness came through faith. Abraham, a sinner like you and me, was justified by faith. Now, I'm going to use the word justified and justification throughout this sermon. So what that means is this. Justification is the act of declaring someone righteous. Abraham was declared righteous by faith. Now, you may be an upstanding person. You may be brave. You may be generous. You may be kind. You may be the kind of person that people come to for wisdom. But I guarantee that you do not compare well to Father Abraham. Abraham spoke directly with God. Abraham left his home and his country to go to a place strictly on the command of God, not even knowing his final destination. And in the highest act of obedience, 
Abraham was willing to kill his son in response to the command of God. So you may be an impressive person, but I guarantee you're no Abraham. You do not compare well to Abraham. And even Abraham was justified before God. Even Abraham gained righteousness before God, not because of what he did, not because of his obedience, but because of his faith, because he believed God. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. It was not because he was obedient. It was not because he was brave. It was because he believed. And verses 4 and 5 add the truth that a person who works for something is getting what they're due. Their wages are not a gift. Back in 2019, my wife and I hired a young man in our congregation, Jacob Korth, to fix some of the sprinklers in our yard. When he was finished, we paid him. And Jacob was thankful for that, but he did not regard the money as a gift because he had earned that money. If someone is working for their righteousness before God, then anything that they think they gain is not regarded as a gift. It's regarded as their due. Yes, God owes me righteousness because I have worked for it. On the other hand, someone who doesn't work but simply believes, they receive righteousness from God as a gift, and their attitude, therefore, is a different level of, of uh, gratefulness. <clears throat> Paul ends this section by going to another Old Testament figure that's highly regarded, and that's King David. He quotes from Psalm 32 about a person who is blessed by God by receiving righteousness apart from their works. God does not count this person's sin against them. Instead of counting sin to them, he counts righteousness. So the emphatic answer to the question, how was Abraham justified, is that Abraham was justified by faith. The second question that Paul asks more firmly establishes this principle of justification by faith. He asks this, is righteousness apart from works only for Jews? Look at verses 9 through 12. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. This is just beautiful. Paul wants to make sure that we don't misunderstand his example of Abraham. Yes, Abraham was justified by faith apart from works, but he was circumcised. He went through God's prescribed ritual for his people. Paul says, okay, that's true, but think about this. Was Abraham counted righteous before he was circumcised or after? And anyone familiar with the story of Abraham knows that it was well before. God's statement that Abraham's faith was counted to him as righteousness came more than a decade before Abraham was circumcised. <clears throat> so the blessing of righteousness apart from works is not dependent on circumcision. That means that justification is not dependent on any ritual. It doesn't depend on faith plus some ritual, even a ritual that God himself gives us. Justification is dependent purely on faith. Circumcision, says Paul, was given as a sign of the righteousness that Abraham already possessed by faith. And because Abraham was justified before he was circumcised, he is the spiritual father of every Gentile who believes. And because Abraham was circumcised, he is the spiritual father of every Jew who believes. The answer to the question is, excuse me, is righteousness apart from works only for the Jew is no. It's for everyone who believes. Now let's look at the second half of this chapter, 
And I want to highlight three features. The first is this, the necessity of justification by faith. The necessity of justification by faith. Why is it necessary that God justify us by faith? Instead of being justified by something else. Look with me at verses 13 through 17. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith. So in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Look especially at verse 16. That is why it depends on faith. The promise of God has to depend on faith in order to be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, meaning his spiritual offspring, everyone who shares his faith in God. Do you see the supreme grace of God here? If he had made the promise of blessing, <clears throat> if he had made the promise of blessing dependent on obedience to the law, two bad things would have happened. First of all, faith would be null, meaning faith would be made empty. There is nothing to trust in if the promise is dependent on obedience. No trust is necessary. All you have to do is try your best to obey, and then you either make it or you don't. The second bad thing that would happen if the promise was dependent on obedience is that the promise would be void, meaning that it would be invalidated or abolished. Why? Because no one keeps the law of God. No one perfectly obeys God. No one fulfills every command that God has given. But out of his grace, God made the blessing through Abraham dependent on faith, dependent on trusting the God of Abraham. That means that we don't have to achieve something to get the promise. We just have to believe in the one true God. The next thing I want to highlight is the nature of justifying faith. Abraham was justified by faith, and then Paul gives us a picture of what that faith looked like. Look with me at verses 17 through 22. <clears throat> As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. As I mentioned before, there's a lot here that I won't get into, so I'll just highlight a couple of items. And the first thing I want you to notice is the object of Abraham's faith. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist the most important aspect of anyone's faith is the object of their faith, not the strength or the quality of their faith. You could be completely confident that the boat you're in is going to carry you across the lake, but if that boat has a leak that you're unaware of, it will sink regardless of how strong your faith in the boat is. On the other hand, let's suppose you get into the boat that belongs to your cousin, and you know that your cousin is a very slipshod person who probably hasn't inspected his boat in years. 
Well, if that boat is seaworthy, it will get you across the lake even if your faith in that boat is shaky. Even if the entire ride across the lake, you're scared and you're worried about sinking. Because the quality of your faith is less important than the object of your faith. If the object of your faith is trustworthy, even if your faith is wavering and weak, you're going to get to your destination. Abraham's faith was in Almighty God. The God who never fails was the object of faith. So even if Abraham's faith had wavered, the promise would still be fulfilled because the object of his faith was trustworthy. Now, the second thing I want you to notice is this phrase, in hope he believed against hope. That's talking about the fact that everything around Abraham, everything that he could perceive with his senses would be against the hope of getting a child. It would be against the hope of God's promise of an heir coming to pass. But his hope Instead of being in what he could see, instead of being what he could perceive, his hope was in the word of God. Despite the fact that he was past the age of childbearing, despite the fact that his wife was past the age of childbearing, he continued to hope in the promise of God, depending on God's word, depending on the character and nature of the God who made the promise. He did not waver in his belief because the God who made the promise was the God who created all things out of nothing. Abraham stood firm on the word of God. God had promised him a son. God had promised to make him the father of many nations. God would do it. And I love the phrase that's used toward the end that he was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And think about this for a second. The only reason that Abraham could be fully convinced is if he had decided that the fulfillment of the promise depended completely upon God. If he believed it depended even a little bit, a little bit on his ability to miraculous, miraculously produce a son, then he couldn't be fully convinced that the promise would be fulfilled. But he was fully convinced because he was saying God, it is all dependent upon you. I'm putting my faith in this promise completely on your ability, and I believe you are able because you are the God who brings life from the dead. You are the God that calls things into existence that do not exist. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he said he would do, and that is what justifying faith looks like. It, it is trust in the power and the nature and the goodness of God. Paul ends this chapter with a personal response to Abraham's justification. Look with me at verses 23 through 25. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. The Lord was gracious to remind us of the personal application of this scripture about Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. We can lay hold of that truth as well. The phrase, it was counted to him for righteousness, isn't just for Abraham, it's for everyone who believes in the God that Abraham believed in. You can experience the same blessing that the patriarch Abraham experienced. You can have the righteousness of God credited to you if you believe in Christ, if you believe in the God who raised Jesus from the dead. Paul refers to Christ's crucifixion and his resurrection. He died to pay the penalty for your sin. He took the punishment that all of your sins deserved. He fulfilled all of God's righteous wrath against everything you have ever done and ever will do that is wrong. And then he rose from the dead, showing that his sacrifice was accepted and thus guaranteeing our justification. 
Now think about this for just a minute. Let's suppose you come here this morning to this sermon and you recognize that you're a sinful person. In fact, you regard yourself as probably the most sinful person you know. You know that you've lived in rebellion against God. You've committed all the sins that are spoken against in Scripture. You've lied. You've committed sexual immorality. You've deceived. You've stolen. You've committed blasphemy. <clears throat> I am here to tell you this morning that if you believe in God, that if you put your trust in Christ, His crucifixion, His resurrection, that God will credit righteousness to your account. He will wash away those sins that you have committed and He will not count them against you. You may know that you deserve God's wrath, but you can experience His acceptance and His love if you will trust in Christ. And you can be sure that God will credit righteousness to your account. You can be the blessed man of Psalm 32 whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Confess your sinfulness to the Lord. Ask His forgiveness and receive it. And then stand on His promise that righteousness is credited to your account. The thrust of this passage is this. Ungodly people are counted righteous before God by believing in Christ. We are justified by faith. In his book, The Plan of Salvation, biblical scholar B.B. Warfield said this, There are fundamentally only two doctrines of salvation. That salvation is from God and that salvation is from ourselves. Either we are justified by faith alone or we contribute something to our salvation. Glory to God, salvation is by justification in faith alone. Salvation is completely dependent upon God and not about upon ourselves. But our temptation, even as believers, is to think that we contribute to our justification by our, by our obedience. Yes, God saved me, but I was a good person. Of course God took me into his family. I live a moral life. I do good things. Everybody likes me. Now, all of those things may be true with respect to other people. In other words, if you compare yourself to those around you, you may look like a good person. You may look like a moral person. You may look like a generous person. But that is not God's standard. God's standard is absolute perfection. All of the commands and requirements of God can be summed up in two. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor, neighbor as yourself. God's requirement is that you perfectly obey both of those commands at all times for your whole life. And you don't. There are times when you do not love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. There are times when you do not love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, most of our lives, we love ourselves more than God and we love ourselves more than our neighbors. <clears throat> because of that, we deserve God's wrath. Because of that, we fall short of God's standard, of God's righteous requirement. But praise God, His Son, Jesus Christ, fulfilled those commandments perfectly his entire life. He loved God with all his heart, soul, and mind, and he loved his neighbor as himself. And Christ Jesus, therefore, was qualified to give himself on your behalf, to offer himself as a spotless sacrifice, to pay the penalty for your sins, so that when you trust in him, his record of righteousness is counted to your account. And that is why we can stand before God righteous by faith in Christ. Fellow believers, our own sinful flesh, the world around us, and our enemy, the devil, are constantly tempting us to think that we contribute to our righteousness. It's when we fall into pride and begin thinking, well, we're better than the people around us, or we do deserve God's blessing. May we be reminded by this passage and by the Spirit of God within us that we deserve none of God's grace and mercy. We do not deserve or earn any righteousness. It is purely on the basis of faith that God has given us the royal righteousness of Christ. May we praise Him and thank Him for that today. Amen.
ungodly people are counted righteous before God by faith in Christ. We are justified by faith. There are a number of ways that you could respond to this message. I've just come up with three to suggest to you. First of all, you can rewrite the passage in your own words to help press this truth more deeply into your heart, to think more clearly about what's being said. You should praise God that you are justified by faith. Praise God that your standing before Him is not based upon how well you're doing at obeying or pursuing Him. It's based upon your trust in His Son. And finally, pray for an opportunity this week to tell someone about this truth. It can be another believer, it can be an unbeliever, just to bring into the conversation the fact that God justifies us by faith. I recognize in this time of social isolation that you may not have that opportunity face to face, but on social media or through the phone or texting, look for an opportunity to share this truth with someone else. To close, let me just remind you of this truth. Ungodly people are counted righteous before God by faith in Christ. We are justified by faith. Let us give God glory and praise because of that. God bless you.